Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 318, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with none other than Jim Sachs, one of the best known and most loved artists on the Commodore Amiga platform. Now Jim has done a lot of great stuff. You've probably seen his images all over the place. If you were in any way involved in the Amiga scene, uh, you have come across his work for sure. But he's also done some really interesting things for the Commodore 64. And he's just a really interesting guy all around. I know you're really going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Mr. Jim Sachs. All right, folks, I am here today with the great Jim Sachs, a name you're probably familiar with if you had an Amiga back in the day. He's done some of the best art to ever grace that platform, including the graphics in Defender of the Crown, Ports of Call, as well as lots of uh, very iconic images that showed up on magazine covers and disc magazines and elsewhere. Uh, I was just remember uh, looking at your Porsche and the Kawasaki image, some of, uh, two of my favorites. Uh, it's really good to get to meet you. Uh, how are you doing today? Oh, just fine. It's a very brisk 32 degrees here in Ashland, Oregon. Uh, and I'm in my house that I'm constructing, been working on it for 10 years, and there's no heat. So <laughs> This is the castle on the cheap you were talking about in your blog? Yeah, this, right. Uh, so what's the story with this uh, this castle? Well, I got tired of living in Southern California, uh, where I had built the first Saks Castle down there, which was actually kind of an iconic Amiga picture, mm -hmm. and it was used on in all kinds of ads for different companies. I never authorized it, but a lot of people used it for advertising monitors and all kinds of stuff. It was even on the cover of the uh, the Atari 1040 ST brochure. Uh, and of course, you know, they were like the evil empire when I was working for Commodore. So that that wasn't, that's kind of like seeing the cover of your, the picture of your house on the cover of the Ku Klux Klan newsletter or something. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that was the first Saks Castle down in Lake Arrowhead, California. And then I moved up here to Ashland, Oregon, and started building on a grand scale. It's a, it's an enormous project. Uh, you know, I wrote the Aquarium Screensaver uh, ten years ago, thirteen years ago now, and that did extremely well for a while. And uh, started on the house with a big crew working on it, and then the recession hit me, and I've been working all alone ever since then. So it's it's just taking forever. All right, so I came across this quote here, Jim, in one of your earlier interviews. I thought this would be a good place to start. Uh, you said that you've always been really uh, into highly detailed art, even when you were a small kid. And then I guess you wanted to be an art director in Hollywood and make your own movies. Uh, I mean, what? I'm just sort of imagining the, the young Jim Sachs. I mean, were you, always, uh, were you the kid that was always drawing things? Yes, Uh I, I called myself an artist, but I was really an illustrator. You know, it's uh, uh, I, I always went into very high de highly detailed artwork, and still do. Uh, those those quotes are still current. I still want to make movies when I grow up. Uh, wrote a screenplay that's won some awards, and uh, trying to get that in front of Disney, uh, the prequel to Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Um, did some artwork for that. The uh, computer game version of it, I did, a, or I started to do for Disney in the uh, late '80s, uh, went nowhere, and uh, that was very depressing. <laughs> now I'm still, you know, even though I'm 66 years old, I'm still waiting for my real career to start. Yeah, since you brought up 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I might jump ahead a little bit uh, to that because I, I was. Trying to figure out what happened with that project. Uh, one of the stories I read said that it, Disney was just taking forever and then finally pulled the budgeting. Uh, but then I found another story that said you got wiped out by some kind of computer virus. Well, both of those are true. Um, when I was doing the original game for Aegis, uh, I was the first person that I've ever heard of in America to be hit by a computer virus. I had backup copies of... Uh, of the program as far as I got uh, with me and with Aegis and Bill Volk at Aegis. Uh, uh, I called him when I saw that uh, my copy had been wiped out. I called up Bill Volk and I said, whatever you do, don't touch that copy that I sent you. And he said, funny you should mention that. We just tried it and it, uh, it wiped itself out. <laughs> so everything that I had was in the boot block. It was all instant start. Uh, in fact, R.J. Michael was giving a, a talk uh, at, a, at the same show I was uh, back then at, at one point, 
and he had just done a game. He was very proud of the fact that it came up running in 10 seconds. And uh, so I took the stage after him. I said, 10 seconds, now watch this. Start counting from the time I put the disc in there. The audience goes, one, done, it started. Wow. So I was very proud of that. And then because it was in the boot block, it all got wiped out by the virus, uh, which the, the authors of the virus did not really consider uh, that serious because it was only the boot block. And they didn't think that anybody would be putting anything there. But so that depressed me for a while. And then Aegis went out of business. So that whole version uh, got axed. And then I approached Disney after that uh, to do the game uh, along with uh, uh, Reichardt von Wilschild, who was uh, the head of, soft, of Silent Software at the time. And he had connections to Disney. Uh, so did a, I spent a year doing the demos and everything for 20,000 leagues. And then Disney got scared. It was going to be a big budget. They pulled the plug. Uh, they were a new software company. They didn't feel like they had enough uh, enough money to really do a grand uh, game like that. Uh, it would have been the greatest game of all time. It, it probably still would stand the test of time. But it didn't happen. You ever thought about going back in and finishing it? or No. Doing a Kickstarter pitch or something for that game? No. Uh, now games, uh, you know, massive multiplayer games, are, are just so far beyond what, what I could... Uh, hope to accomplish that it's just not worth it well did anybody did uh, your parents or other family were they artists artists as well my mother when she was young drew pictures of movie stars and uh was quite good at it uh and that inspired me when i was a kid you know uh i was always very slow though i was considered that i wanted to be a, com a commercial artist and thought i would work for disney someday but I was so slow that I, it, it, it was very disconcerting that other commercial artists could get something done in a day and it would take me a week. So I, I didn't know where that was going to go uh, with hand-drawn artwork. And then computers came along and found that, uh, it, although I was still slow on that, everybody else was too. So it didn't make any difference. So you went to college in California to become an architect. Right. Where was that college? It was Cal State LA. Okay. And then uh, I went directly into the Air Force out of college and became a pilot. So I, I never used the architectural training except designing my own houses. So what made you want to go into the Air Force? I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly jets. Is this I did. a dream, a childhood one. dream, or is it just you, something caught yeah. your attention? No, it was a childhood dream also. And fly you were... big, fast jets. I did. You're flying something called a C-141 Star Lifter? <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a, something out of a Star Wars movie. <laughs> it's a four-engine uh, jumbo jet that has been retired, along with everything else that I uh, had to do with in the Air Force. Uh, all the bases that I was stationed at are, are gone. The airplane I flew was gone. Uh, I'm gone. <laughs> like a, it never happened. How big is the Star Lifter thing? It's uh, extremely big, big four-engine jumbo jet, uh, 300 and, well, over 400,000 pounds. I mean, compared now, to, say, a commercial airliner? Yeah, a little bit bigger than most commercial airliners. Wow. So, you're so it was a good life, you know, in the Air Force, uh, flying the airplane. Yeah, I mean, you train in, in Jet fighter, and that's a lot of fun. They're fast, they're supersonic. And then uh, when you get into the real Air Force, then you fly whatever you're going to be flying for the rest of your career. And, and that's uh, uh, a jumbo jet is like driving an enormous truck. So flying the airplane itself wasn't really all that much fun, but the life was great. I got to see the whole world every month. It was just fantastic. It probably came in handy when you were doing ports of call. Well, a little bit. Yeah, it's uh, kind of similar. Uh, you pick up cargo, you take it somewhere. Uh, the thing is with the Air Force, you feel like you're still a kid. You know, you're a captain in the Air Force, and, and uh, you feel like, well, I mean, you're 25 years old or so, and, and uh, the Air Force gives you a multi-million dollar airplane and a crew and says, here, go to Europe. <laughs> find your way there, find how to land, and then come on back, pick up a cargo. And it just feels like 
they're trusting you with all this enormous responsibility, uh, which is great. You know, it's it's really uh, I, I don't know any other field that you could go into where that could that would be true. You ever seen Top Gun? Sure. I mean, how far off the mark is that movie? That's Navy and uh, Navy. Uh, they have to land on uh, aircraft carriers. We don't do that in the Air Force. So that's their big deal, you know, that uh, skill set that they feel like they have and nobody else does. So they're they're always, uh, you know, trying to lord it over you that they can do that. Uh, but we have the great life, you know. We got to see the, see the world all through Asia. Every my uh, Even though I have an in-country medal for, or ribbon for going to Vietnam, I was only there on the last day of the war. As the war ended, I was I was there. We picked up a bunch of refugees and babies and uh, brought them back. But I don't feel like I'm a real veteran, you know. I never got shot at. Uh, so your first computer was the Commodore 64 that you got from the local Costco, right? Right. Yeah, which was called the Price Club. So what was it about that? You I mean back then you had so many different platforms to choose from? I mean, why did you? What? How did you gravitate towards that one? After I got out of the Air Force, I was searching around for something to do. I, I went in with my former navigator and, and bought a house and restored it and lost our shirts doing that. And, and so I was still looking for something to do. I had just gotten married like about a year before. And I, I would always hear kids talking about bits and bytes, and I felt left out. Uh, so I decided to go to the Commodore 64 store and get one and, and uh, see what it was all about. Took it home, and within a couple of days, I was typing in programs from magazines uh, in BASIC uh, with lots of numbers and lots of commas, pages and pages and pages. And then it would do some little thing, a little lunar lander or something. I didn't have any storage device for it. Uh, so whatever I would type in for all those days, when I turned it off, I would lose it all. <laughs> and uh, uh, realized that the computer was... Uh, capable of doing things far more than anybody was actually using it for. And that really intrigued me that I would be on kind of the ground floor, that type of thing, with the 64. Uh, the Sinclair and other, other computers had been out uh, for a while, but the 64, you know, it had so many colors and, and so much memory. 64K, who could ever want anything more than that? So uh, uh, found I had a flair for it. Uh, got a, a Hessmann cartridge and got into machine language on it within about two weeks and uh, started writing Saucer Attack. And that took a couple of months to write. And then uh, uh, found that nobody else was really doing that kind of thing. You know, it was uh, just just with my low level of, uh, of knowledge on, on computers, I was already way ahead of everybody else. So I, I got a real good review in Run Magazine from Commodore and, and uh, uh, sold that out of my house. Just, you know, first Ziploc storage bag type of thing. And then Saks uh, Enterprises, I think you called the that? company. Saks Enterprises? Yes, Saks Enterprises, which was my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> it just amazes, amazes me to think, uh, you know, you had no computer training, nothing like this, and you just got this computer and then taught yourself to do this machine language and made a commercial game. You said, what, in two weeks? Yeah, this, wow. Uh, you know, I started it within two weeks, and then about two months later, first I had to go to Toys R Us and get a Hesmine cartridge, which was $25. And I was agonizing over whether I could afford that. Uh, but finally my wife said, well, go, go ahead. Go. It might be a new career or something. So I, I bought it and uh, got into machine language. And I loved machine language, and everything has gotten away from that now. I, I love the idea of having direct access to all the bytes and all the registers of the computer. And with the Commodore 64, you knew where they were. So they actually had addresses. I, I love the, the uh, uh, finality of all that. Of course, all that went out the window, and now everything slides around in memory, and, and it's very uh, hard to deal with for me, somebody like me. Uh, but at the time, that was I was just in heaven. I would draw an enormous picture uh, on graph paper with every single pixel, every single dot on it in a certain color. And you're familiar with the Commodore 64. It's very hard to get things to be certain colors. You have eight by eight block uh, squares, and you only have certain rules of what colors can be within each square. 
So I draw a great big picture of Washington, D.C. on graph paper and then go through one dot at a time and program it into the computer. And that was my background picture. And I just love that kind of thing. It just, uh, to see it light up one dot at a time on the screen was just breathtaking to me. Yeah, it was a breathtaking game for sure. I mean, everybody talked about how great this game looked. Uh, you said a run magazine. I found one in Zap. Uh, Saucer Attack looks brilliant. The graphics are amazing and the animation superb. <laughs> you know, that's amazing, the level of detail. I mean, it's that level attention to detail. Again, you know, we already see it in that game, right? All those little touches. I think it was probably the most uh, detailed Washington, D.C. Uh, image at the time. Yeah. And then uh, they came out with things like the koala pad, and I didn't have to, uh, to type in the numbers for all the pixels anymore. You know, I could actually draw on, on it. And then I drew a, uh, used a koala pad, drew a, a picture of the, uh, uh, the Lincoln Memorial, and that won the Commodore uh, graphics competition. So that got kind of my foot in the door with Commodore and, and people you know, that I could call there and eventually got uh, developer status on the Amiga when that came out. What kind of prize did you win for that contest? You won $1,000. Oh. So at that point, it was pretty obvious the Commodore 64 purchase had been a good investment for you. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> Although I paid full price for it. You know, it was, it was $595. Uh, you know, it just... Uh, it, it came down to like one ninety nine about two weeks after I bought it. Oh, that stinks. Yeah. I saw where you were talking at one point about doing a, a hyper-realistic 3D version of the game. That uh, was some kind of Google Maps-like uh, technology. Uh, that sounds really interesting to me. Uh, what, what happened to that project? It, it, actually, the technology was Google Street View uh, about 30 years before that came out. And uh, I went to Washington, D.C. My wife and I took a vacation. And this is when the Amiga came out. So I was going to do a, a hyper-realistic version on the Amiga. And uh, uh, I decided that around the mall area of Washington, D.C., I could stand at every intersection and do 360-degree view. And when I got home, I could, I could uh, do a very early version of a panoramic shot. On, on every one of those uh, uh, still shots. And I could make it look like you were in some kind of tank and moving down the street. And then anytime you got to one of those intersections, you could move the turret of the cam of the uh, tank all the way around and shoot flying saucers. It would be destroying the city. Uh, you know, I forget why I abandoned that. It, it's still a kind of a neat idea. And uh, of course, uh, Google, Street view, you can do that like everything. Uh, but it, I think that it still would have been a neat idea. I, I really, I forget, some other project came out. Uh, uh, I guess I got involved with Defender of the Crown after that. So that actually involved some money, and, you know, not just speculation on my own part. So I, that's probably uh, the, the point where I abandoned that. A bit of a, a silly question about saucer attack. And uh, when you were flying those planes, did you ever see a UFO? No, never did. That would have been fun. <laughs> All right, so you made some pretty good money with Saucer Attack, right? But I read again and again that the piracy was just such a such a problem for you. Uh, the, the quote you had was, uh, Saucer Attack, the Commodore 64 game everyone had, <laughs> but no one purchased. <laughs> And what was the, the deal with this piracy? Why, why, why were they pirating the game so much? Uh, it was just uh, easy for them. You know, I had virtually no copy protection on it, so uh, uh, people would, would write to me that they were so proud of themselves in hacking it. And i say, are you kidding? I put almost no copy protection. You shouldn't be proud of yourself at all. <laughs> what, they wrote you and said that? Oh, yeah. It's kind of a jerk move, huh? Oh yeah. Uh, when did you do that uh, that image of the time crystal guy? You know, where does that fit into this? Well, the uh, the original time crystal demo on the Commodore sixty four um, was going to be my second game after Saucer Attack on that on that machine, and that's when piracy just got got too rampant, and I, I abandoned that. 
Uh, but that people still look at that. There's a version on YouTube that you can look at of uh, the Time Crystal demo. That was going to be a game where the scenario is you're flying along in your time machine that you've invented one day, and the crystal that powers the machine shatters and gets and pieces of it get thrown into about five different times. And the only way you can ever get home is to go into those times and get out of the machine and explore and, and look for pieces of the crystal uh, and then come and put it back together. So the first scene, the, the only one that I did, was the, uh, uh, the prehistoric scene. And uh, I used the basis of kind of a lunar lander module uh, spaceship where you can actually control the time machine as it comes in from a distance. And you can fly it over the volcano, in fact, down inside the volcano and land it. And there's a dinosaur that walks by and all that kind of stuff. And that's another one where I drew the, the uh, background scene on a giant sheet of graph paper and uh, just went through and put it in the computer one pixel at a time. Uh, and then uh, that's when piracy got so bad. Well, I was going to port that over to the Amiga. It, it was still a, a really good uh, scenario for a computer game. So uh, uh, I drew the picture of the time machine as one of the first things I ever drew on the, on the Amiga right, with Graphicraft, which is a very primitive uh, paint program. I don't think I've ever heard uh, of that one before. I saw you had been working with it. Yeah, Graphicraft was written by R.J. Michael, and it was really meant by Commodore to be the first tool for developers to, to try to, to use. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if it was actually sold in stores, but it was given to developers. And then uh, Aegis came along and uh, got rights to make it Aegis Images. And it, it is just verbatim Aegis Images. So, uh, and then eventually uh, Deluxe Paint came out and, and eclipsed all of those other programs. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Stay tuned. There's much, much uh, more coming up. We haven't even got to the really good stuff in this interview. Very meaty stuff, especially if you are a fan of the Amiga or graphics art, uh, graphic art in general. There's lots of, just trust me on this one, uh, the best is yet to come. As always, I want to thank you very much for your support of me and the Matt Chat Show interviews with people like, uh, you know, Jim Sachs and uh, all these others is only possible because of your support. So if you haven't stepped up to the plate yet, please just go to the Patreon site there in the show notes. Only a buck, all I ask for all this content. And thank you very much to everyone who has already done that. Really, really cool, guys. Thank you very much. Now, what about that news from the Matt Cave? whole lot of stuff going on, uh, but there's a couple cool things. Uh, the first up is this game called Garodon, or Garodon, not sure how to pronounce this, G-A-R-O-U-D-A-N. It's described as a choplifter in reverse for the Sega Genesis, kind of a retro game. It looked kind of interesting to me. Uh, it kind of looks to me, kind of reminds me of that Rampage game. You start off as an egg, and then you become, it looks like a pterodactyl. Anyway, it just was kind of bizarre. I don't know, something about it just caught my eye and I wanted to uh, share it with you guys. Uh, check it out. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, and let's see, Adam sent this in. Uh, the first look at Night Dive Studios' remake of System Shock. Really cool images there. Uh, if you're a fan of System Shock, I, <laughs> I'm sure you're on top of this, but just in case you haven't heard of it, I'll put a link in the show notes again. You go check, the, check out those images. Really cool stuff. And then finally, Shane Plays has a interview up with uh, yours truly, as well as Johnny Wood and Philippe Pepe uh, from the RPG Codex. We had a little, I don't know, maybe 20 minute chat about RP, uh, CRPGs. It was a lot of fun. And you guys, uh, if you missed the broadcast, don't worry. You can just go to shaneplays.com and catch up on that episode, as well as all the other awesome stuff that Shane gets up to. All right, so. <sighs> What about that ale of the week? Well, in honor of uh, Mr. Sachs, I was looking for something with a, an Air Force or a you know an uh, aviation theme because uh, he spent all those years as a pilot. 
And I found this one called Zealander India Pale Ale. This is from the Topling Goliath Hot Patrol uh, Brewery, TGP. And it has, a, as you can see, a picture of an airplane on the label. So that seemed appropriate. Uh, these guys are out of Decorah, Iowa. See, Zealander showcases both the explosive upfront taste and the gentle nuances in the finish of the Nelson Sauvon Hop. Sauvy? Sauvon? <laughs> Uh, anyway, Nelson uh, something hot. It, it's a oh, mistake. I think that should be. Its lingering bitter body brings forward both dankness <laughs> and grapefruit flavors. Is dankness something that you want? Uh, anyway, dankness and grapefruit flavors delivering a subtle earthy finish that perfectly complements this hop heavy's I, this hop heavy IPA's explosive beginning. <laughs> Oh, so this apparently is dank and explosive. Uh, anyway, sounds interesting for sure. Uh, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Zealander here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> it smells really good, kind of a cross between a lemongrass and a motor oil. <laughs> I was sort of said, just kidding about the uh, motor oil, uh, by the way. Uh, you can definitely smell the hops in this. It's very crisp aroma, very citrusy. Uh, smells great. Uh, so let's give it a taste. Uh, that's a very uh, nice flavor. What do they call it? Explosive or something? It's actually a very uh, sort of uh, a light, a sort of lemony uh, flavor there. It's actually nice and smooth. Uh, <laughs> really good. Now let me try uh, try it again here. Yeah, you get a, a little bit of that uh, bitterness, but that goes away very quickly, and you just get sort of a pleasant aftertaste on this. Getting kind of a kind of what you'd expect from an IPA. A little bit of a nutty flavor, a little bit of a coffee-like, very light uh, sort of taste with that. Mostly the uh, what am I tasting there? Uh, I'm not really familiar with this kind of hops, but you can definitely tell there's something unusual about the flavor. Uh, I'll try it one more time here. Okay, so you get a little bit of bitterness going down, that goes away, and then you get this sort of nutty, uh, a sort of nutty flavor I would describe that. It's, you know, very refreshing, not a lot of, uh, alcohol taste or anything. I'm not sure what the alcohol content is in this, but it's actually quite tasty. I'm really enjoying this one. It's got a nice uh, thick uh, consistency to it. Yeah, just all around interesting uh, beer. Yeah, you know, I almost do sort of taste like a little bit of a motor oil. <laughs> not that I've ever tasted motor oil, but you know that uh, that sort of taste you might get in your mouth if you're in a mechanic shop, uh, which Sounds disgusting, maybe, but it actually is quite fitting uh, with this uh, airplane theme, I think. Uh, I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Really interesting flavors. Uh, I haven't really tasted anything quite like this before. So it's, it's kind of hard to describe it exactly, uh, but it's quite good. So five out of five drinking horns for the Zealander. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, I know that... Uh, you know, of course, Jim's a huge fan of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which I've also uh, really enjoyed that novel by Jules Verne. So anyways, looking for a quote by the great Jules Verne. And by the way, if you haven't read him, my God, <laughs> uh, go read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It's good stuff. Anyway, the quote goes something like this. Science is made up of mistakes, but they are mistakes which it is useful to make because they lead little by little to the truth. See you guys next week. The first thing to remember is always treat your kite like you treat your woman. What do you mean, sir? Do you mean, um, do you mean take her home at the weekend to meet your mother? <laughs> no, I mean get inside her five times a day and take her to heaven and back. <laughs>